the mental health systems in Britain and the U.S. are both drug-fueled merry-go-rounds, and both of them spiritually devoid. Despite the proliferation of new drugs, psychiatry comes up with it. It doesn't work. So the way this works is the psychiatrists made up every single disorder in the DSM. They started out with three, and in the DSM-4, there were 297. In the DSM-5, they, they make them up. They, they get together in a group, and they vote these things into being. And then the pharmaceutical industry goes behind them and formulates all these toxic drugs to treat the symptom. They don't have any cures for anything. They don't know what causes mental illnesses. All they do is describe them. So despite the $330 billion a year, pharmaceutical industry and psychiatry are made together on selling drugs and appointments. The gross national product of all Britain is $680 billion. So these guys are raking in about half the national product of Britain. They're making a lot of money on this, and they don't want it interfered with, and, and be damned to the truth. Um, so they have, no, they have no science behind their diagnosis. They, they have no cures. All they're doing is pushing drugs. There was over 600 million prescriptions in the U.S. for any psychotic drugs last year. So uh, the drug companies are making $13.69 billion on the sales of antidepressants alone. Um, yeah. And this, you know, let me see, 20,539 million on the sale of anti anxiety drugs. So they're making a fortune. And they're basing all this on th that mental illness is a biological uh, entity. It is not. And they have no proof for it. They have no tests to test for any of their diagnoses. So what happened back in the 1800s? Psychiatry was the stepchild. They grabbed onto these phenothiazine drugs and held onto them with their lives. And they teamed up with Big Pharma to push propaganda that mental illness was due to a, uh, a chemical imbalance of the brain. So if, if they didn't have some physical malady to treat, the question becomes what are they treating? So <clears throat> they started off with three items in, the, in their dictionary or their DSM, their dictionary of manual of mental illnesses. And they have no lab test to test for any of that. And it started off in the early 1900s. Scores of natural healing methods were available back then. They had, you know, natural cures. They had uh, the Tesla violet ray. They had ozone therapy, naturopath therapy. Uh, when doctors began prescribing alternative treatments to drugs, the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Foundation didn't like that. They were losing market shares. So in 1910, the Carnegie Foundation and the Rockefeller Group they sponsored the infamous Flexner Report, which shut down medical and teaching, uh, shut down medical schools teaching subjects outside of mainstream pharmacology. So what they did is they paid off Congress to pass laws benefiting big pharma. So if they weren't teaching in their medical schools pharma pharmacological based medicine, they they could not issue a uh, medical certificate or a medical degree. So they, they broke into the education uh, area to the medical schools and, and virtually said, okay, you, you don't teach that all these mental illnesses are due to biological cause that can be treated with drugs. Forget it. We're not giving you any, any funding. We're not giving you any grants. We're, you know, we're not publishing any of your stuff. So that reduced it down to like two medical schools. So they took over the medical establishment. And in 1910, um, they came out with that Flexner report where they paid off Congress to you know, promote their drugs. So any medical school that taught any treatment outside of drugs could not legally license doctors. They lost grants and funding. Doctors who were prescribing any treatment besides psychopharmacology or pharmacology were, were threatened with the loss of their license. So doctors at that point lost the freedom to prescribe alternative therapy. So in, in the 1800s, psychiatry was a stepchild of the medical establishment. So now the entire mental health system is dominated by psychiatrists who are the lackeys and the drug pushers for Big Pharma. So they come up with these diagnoses and Big Pharma comes up behind them and develops drugs to treat these fabricated diagnoses. With this drug treatment that they've been using for you know, 100 years now, what is the, what's the result? Well, here in the, in the United States, 47,500 people kill themselves a year. You know, this is our mental health system. 47,000. That's as many people as were killed in Vietnam almost. Yeah. You know, suicide was the second leading cause of death among individuals between the age of 10 and 34, and the fourth leading cause of death among individuals between ages 55 and 44. There were nearly two and a half times as many suicides in the United States as there were homicides. So is this a mental health system that works? You know, and this is just suicide. Look, look at all the people who are depressed and have other maladies. These drugs that they're dishing out do not work. They, they merely suppress symptoms. And for psychotics, what they do is they, they're major tranquilizers. They're, they're kind of like chemical lobotomies. So there's reports that they feel nervous and sedated at the same time. There is an absolute fear. I can't describe to you how profound the fear of it is. You are terrorized and terrified. Nothing is familiar. Even though you can see with your eyes where you are, you are in a different realm. Nothing is familiar. So the terror of being in a, in a realm that is unfamiliar and you, no one can reach you. And so that, that's the nervousness, that's the anxiety that you're stuck in a place and no one can reach you. And at the same time, you're sedated. You are. You, it's like you're held down by these chemicals, you know, so that you can't you can't express how you feel. It's impossible. Um, I think that, that's how I would describe it, Jerry. And you can't defend yourself. No, you know? no, and you then... can't defend yourself and you can't go anywhere. And I remember talking to one of the doctors and he said to me, Jenny, you come from a good family. Why are you like this? And I'm thinking, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? How can you what have got to do with anything. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, what, it's like a, what do they have at the Monty Python show over there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I know, I know. It is, it is pretty, it is pretty desperate. Um, now, how much time did they spend diagnosing you? I mean, before they started shoveling pills down your throat. How much time did they spend talking to you? None whatsoever. Nobody spent a moment speaking to me. It was uh, that's not true. There was a doctor called Dr. White, and he said to me, "Can you hear voices?" And my head was so packed full of I don't know what that it took me a moment to understand what he was saying. And he said, "Do you want to kill yourself?" And I said, and then he, he asked more questions. And I just said, "Wait a minute, I just one at a time, please, one at a time," because my head was so packed full of noise. And were you able to answer any of them before he hit you with another one? No, it was impossible. It was just question after question. <laughs> question. So of course, because oh. I couldn't answer because my brain wasn't computing. Um, you know, what, what, what do you do? I mean, obviously put me down as it's like, which I was. I mean, let's put it another way. They think that when people get into this state, they are hallucinating and they are so called schizophrenic. They're not in their normal mind. It's yeah, true. They're less than human. Less than human, yeah. Right. It's true. But none of them know why or where or how or even care. They don't care. They just want to identify the symptoms and check off their tick list or tick off their checklist. And then dish out drugs. Dish out drugs. Yeah. See, that's yeah. one thing I saw when I was working at the state hospital. Nobody was curious. Not one of the staff was curious, other than myself, about what the voices were telling these patients. Yeah. You know, and they were getting into trouble all the time listening to their voices. And not one staff out of their thousands of staff there ever took the time to ask them, what are these things telling you? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That 
just sit down, you know, someone just sit down with somebody and say, okay, what's going on inside your head? Tell us what's happening, you know. No, they're, 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 they're mentally distant. So just, oh, oh, you're hearing those voices again there, Joe, oh, here's more pills, there you go, shut up now. But that's exactly what happens, so, yeah. so they, they don't tell them. If the voice, they give them a dose of the meds, the, the patients feel how awful it is, and then next time they have an, uh, a meeting, the psychiatrist says, well, how are you doing? And, well, I'm still hearing the voices, so they get dosed again. They increase the dose or they change it to something stronger. Yeah. So after that, the patients don't tell them anything. Yeah, I'm doing fine, I'm doing great. Yeah, no, I don't need any more meds, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. So they lie to the psychiatrist in mass scale because they don't want any more of these meds. These, the, the, those meds are not abusable meds. They're, they're not anything that anybody would want to take. So yeah. based on, you probably told them, hey, I'm hearing voices. Next thing you know, you're on, you're on medication. Oh, yeah. 99% of whoever walks into a psychiatrist's office is going to come out with some kind of drug. So everything revolves around these drugs. And they don't spend hardly any time talking to the patient, trying to figure out what the initial problem is, where, where these problems are coming from. You know? And, yeah. and, this, and we're, when I was at the state hospital there, they were giving shock treats. And these were brutal shock treats. I almost fainted the first time I saw one. So it wasn't the doctors that were so much prescribing this as it was the attendants who say, hey, Johnny, Johnny Doe over there is causing us a lot of trouble this week. Uh, I think he needs another treatment. He'd be put on the line for a shock treatment. They put these electrodes on his head. And man, just, I don't know how many volts, but they give him a giant needle of uh, muscle relaxation, uh, muscle relaxant, giant hypodermic. It looks like a horse needle. And I asked them, well, why, why do you have to do that? And they said, well, if we didn't do that, their bones would break when we shock. So here, here's modern, you know, psychiatric treatment, their shock treatment. It was used as a punishment and a control tactic. So they're doing physiological damage. And the side effects of, of those drugs are not side effects. Those are the effects. Those are toxic effects of these drugs. They may calm you down, but they're doing irreversible damage to your brain. The uh, autopsies of uh, schizophrenics that were in the hospitals for long periods of time, all their brains were shrunk. So when they brought that up, the uh, pharmaceutical industry and psychiatry went, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's not our drugs. It's the schizophrenia germ, whatever it is. It's shrinking their brain. So they did it. They, they put monkeys on those drugs. They put uh, uh, rats on those drugs and found out that their brains were shrunk too. But never have I seen a psychiatrist sit down with a patient before prescribing those drugs and telling them how dangerous those drugs actually are or yeah. could be and the side effects that they could expect and what long-term use of those drugs would do to you. Has ever one of, the, one of the psychiatrists ever told you anything about what those drugs do and how dangerous they are? Mm -hmm. I've seen hundreds of patients in the state hospital that had the Thorazine shuffle. Their nervous systems were so fried out they couldn't even walk with a normal gait anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so they started off with blaming mothers for, with the way they raised the kids. I mean, they've had excuse mm -hmm. after excuse after excuse of what causes schizophrenia. And the latest one, the, the chemical brain imbalance, you see how much money they're making on it. So they're, they're, they don't want a cure. They, they want to keep treating these illnesses forever with their expensive drugs. And, yeah. and those drugs here in the U.S., I mean, to, to get a month's supply of antipsychotic drugs here in the U.S. costs eight hundred to thousand dollars. You can go across the border to Mexico and get the same number of pills made by the same exact company for seventy-five. Mm -hmm. That shows you what what scammers these people are. They're just you know raking every country for as much as they can get out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, for... That's such a completely different approach to the Western attitude, which was just there's something wrong with these people. Let's just suppress everything. And then I came across a guy called Clancy McKenzie who said that he said that um, all people with schizophrenia have had trauma prior to the age of two. So I, I thought, what could that trauma have been? Well, these are real entities, and I have met them many times, and they're still with me at times. They're not voices, and I'm not schizophrenic. I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form. But I am conscious of them. Well, Sherry said the same thing. She said they come back and they hit her periodically to see what they can get away with. And when she blows them off, they, they disappear for a while, but they, they keep coming back. Well, they're just, just coming back to me. What, what I occasionally get is a flash picture in my brain of something horrific. And I know that's them showing me a picture of something they want me to do. But um, it doesn't, it, it, they just absolutely, it's, it's a momentary glimpse of something, some fear. And, it's usually upsetting, right? Yeah, oh yeah. So what Jenny's talking about is over 45 years, I started recognizing certain patterns. First, it was one, then two, and then three, but they kept coming and coming and coming. So if there's no chemical brain imbalance, if this is not due to genetics, then what are these patterns? You know? And, and now we, we got up to like 23 patterns. And what I, one thing I asked Jenny is, I gave her a copy and said, okay, let, let's go through these one by one because if these voices are running patterns that are repeatable and predictable and unswerving, then they can't be hallucinations as the psychiatric mafia is insisting. Mm -hmm. Hallucinations don't run patterns. They're random. You can't predict what a hallucination is going to do or say, but what, you can predict what the voices are going to do and what they're going to say. And so if you can predict it, then they're not hallucinations. And, and so if that's the truth, which it is, then what in the blazes is psychiatry treating with all these toxic drugs? Yeah. They're, all they're doing is suppressing symptoms. They have no idea what the cause is. They have no idea what the cure is. They have no scientific backing for any of their diagnoses, and they have no tests. Mm -hmm. This is far from medical practitioners who have tests for diabetes or sugar or, or blood ailment. I mean, they have lab tests where they can give the test, and there it is. It appears, and it's measurable. Psychiatry has nothing that's measured. They have no tests. They have no scientific validity. They have no, no they have no, no idea what the cause is. They have no idea what the cures are. Mm -hmm. So going through, so what happened is Jenny, after a year, Jenny contacted me. Uh, she heard, heard me say make a comment about uh, these the, the psychic, psychotic voices that schizophrenics here are virtually identical to what the, the mainstream media and the deep state are. Their, their propaganda is right now. They match up one to one. So the psychotic voices match up exactly with what the deep state and the propaganda they're putting out to the world match. And, and as we go through these, you know, I asked Jenny to uh, add whatever experiences she might have to these. But as we go through these, watch and see if they don't match what the propaganda that, that CNN and, and, and BBC and, and all the rest of them, the mainstream media are putting out right now. The, the first and primary one is negativity. You know, the most common consistent trait of schizophrenic voices is that they are consistently negative, derogatory, insulting, abusive, and destructive. Although they, they might seem to be helpers for short periods of time, invariably they will turn around and once they have the victims hooked and gain their trust, they'll begin attacking them and tearing them down, telling them awful things about themselves, putting confusing thoughts in their head and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, messing them up. But, but you look at TV, you turn on the TV and it's just negative, negative, negative stuff. If one yeah. thing after another news is filled with negativity. Yeah. Jenny, do you remember any of the things those voices told you or, or are they too, too far oh, around? I think, that, I think that's just too far away in terms of negativity. I can't remember that's done it. But I mean, if I go, if we
And it's not really the Vax people who are like that, it's the media pumping this up, you know? Yeah, so these people like really, oh, uh, I'll tell you, when, when this all comes out, oh, oh, I will not mm-hmm. pump oh, and, and it will. So yeah. some of the things that, that the voices do tell uh, schizophrenic patients is you're ugly, you're stupid, you're no good, nobody likes you, nobody loves you, nobody will ever love you, uh, you'll never succeed at anything. And, and these are all thoughts that everybody has to different degrees. But with, with schizophrenics, it, it grabs hold of them, you know, and, and it mobilizes. And there's different kinds of schizophrenia. There's some where, you know, the person just whizzes out and they're gone. But the paranoid schizophrenia is the single biggest one. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's where these voices are talking to them, telling them to cuss people out and attack people. And, um, you know, <clears throat> research indicates that individuals individuals diagnosed with schizophrenic and bipolar are responsible for 10% of all homicides in the United States and 33% of the mass killings. And that's these voices in there. After, after they're arrested, they said, they said, well, why'd you do it? And they, the voices told me to do it. You know? a, a Swedish study of 2,000 patients convicted of homicide or attempted homicide in 1988 to 2001 found 11% were schizophrenic or bipolar. So what these things do is they, they start taking control and you have to battle for your own mind. Mm-hmm. So they start edging inward and just taking control, steadily taking control and, until they, you know, they got you and they're controlling you. And the reason they're doing that is to generate negative emotional energy, which they feed off and then they drain you. Did you ever feel drained after they came? Do you remember, Jenny? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Felt very, very tired. Exactly. I remember they couldn't even get out of bed. They're so exhausted after being attacked by these things. It's like it's kind of like this vampire, isn't it? My head was too full to compute anything. It was so top block with crap going on. And I think the way they were communicating with me was to tap into my visceral fears. So I don't remember the thoughts. I don't remember the alienating thoughts. I remember the fears, the terror, the way they terrorized me. And the terror kept me hyper vigilant, hyper alert. So I was running around like magic, hyper vigilant, hyper alert. And it was that that was making me so tired because I was on constant guard because these things were showing me pictures and they were um, confronting me with my fears constantly. Um, I, I just didn't even have headspace to think what they were saying. It was just constant fear. That's all I can describe it as. Yeah, they, they want to generate negative emotion, which is mm-hmm. what they feed off. They can't, they can't produce it themselves. So what they're doing to us is kind of what we do to cows. You turn them loose out in the field and the pasture, they eat grass, bring them back, you isolate them, you milk them, you know, drain them, and then let them go again. So that's kind of what they're doing to schizophrenic. You know, they can't produce that negative emotional energy themselves. They can't stand positive emotional energy and they feed off of the negative. So that's why they're filling your head full of crap. You know, it's terrifying crap. They also have access to your entire memory. They can go in there and they can pull up stuff that you've done. I've had patients tell me stuff they did 25 years ago that they'd long forgotten about. The voices pulled up and threw in their face and said, Look, look at what you did. You're, you're such a rot person. Even back then when you were young, you were a rot person. Look, look at this. So they have complete access to the patient's memory, which is odd. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of times the voices themselves want the patient to think that the government is putting these thoughts in their head and that it's, it's some outside entity or a Martian or, or the CIA. But the problem is if they adopt that and it is schizophrenia, then there's nothing they can do about it. It moves the locus of control outside of themselves and the voices are off and running. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. The government is targeting you. It's coming from, you know, outer space. You're helpless. They get you no matter where you go. It's like, you know, the, the gates of hell. And the voices have convinced them that it's people from outer space or the government that are putting these thoughts in their head and there's nothing they can do about it. Then they're gone. You can tell the difference between people that are haunted with voices and the ones that between people that are haunted with voices and the ones that are, um, you know, voice goal, you can tell the difference. The voice goal people are perfectly present. They're here right now. The schizophrenic are not here. You can see it in their eyes. You can feel it in their energy. They're not here. Right. And that, that's the difference to me. I've had clients that have, that have been talking to individuals and I've had clients who are schizophrenic and yeah. the schizophrenic have a completely different energy. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you meet with people and stay connected with people. All of this nonsense about social isolation, that is a recipe for disaster. The damage of isolation, how isolation absolutely suppresses your immune system, makes you very vulnerable. And well, that's um, one of the things the voices foster too. You know, don't trust anybody. Don't talk to anybody don't say anything to anybody stay away from everybody lock yourself in your bedroom yeah. same thing and it's very dangerous because that allows them to just jump in there and take over when you're isolated and bored that allows them to just jump in there and take over when you're isolated and bored that allows them to just jump in there and take over when you're isolated and bored making sure you're always doing the right thing don't let anyone down your life depends on it and of course we go back to the demonic forces they're going to hone in exactly where they need to if you're not everything to everybody else then you're a useless waste of faith yeah. and that's the message you get like, like yeah. carlos casanata said they give us their mind yeah. so so they actually can move into your mind and they can they try to take it over but like i said they, they have complete access to your entire memory everything bad that's ever happened to you every, anything bad that you've ever done they have complete access and they just pull it up and they will just throw it in your face over and over and over again generating that negative emotional energy and then they suck it off yeah. you know yeah. they so, hate us and they, they hate children more than anything right. you know? and they will they will go after marriages they try to break up marriages they go after friendships what they want to do is isolate you and you'll notice that most schizophrenics try to isolate themselves you know, and, and they want to stay away from anybody everybody they're afraid of what people are going to do or say or think or and the voices even tell them you know if you talk to you talk about us they'll lock you up they'll throw you in a mental hospital nobody's going to believe you they actually tell them this yeah. you know? and, and uh, they run they run some very strange patterns on top of that you know they get louder after sunset consistent you know once the sun goes down the voices get louder and they get loudest at three to four in the morning yeah. you know? so you know those of you out here who, who work with schizophrenics or who are living with schizophrenics don't take my word for it look for yourself it's right there yeah. just open your eyes and look and you'll see these things for yourself and so will psychiatry if they ever come off their high horse you know? that, that's Psychiatrists will tell patients, oh, you hear voices, just ignore them. They will not be ignored. They get louder when they're ignored. You know, and and uh, you know, if the psychiatry was to take the time to follow up with their own recommendation, the patient would tell them, no, that doesn't work. They get louder. I remember doing that in the state hospital. I, I was sitting in there with a the psychiatrist and a patient, and uh, the patient asked, well, what should I do? What, you know, when the voice comes up, well, I'll give you medicines, and then you just ignore them. So I called him back a week later, and I said, How, how's that working? He said, it doesn't work at all. They get worse. They get louder when they're ignored. And I found that to be consistent. So after t- speaking to hundreds of schizophrenics, they all report that if they try to ignore the voices, the voices get louder. Mm-hmm. Another pattern. 
they call hallucinations a running pattern. They're not hallucinations. So what are they freaking treating? What are they what are they dousing people with? What if they don't cure anything? They merely suppress symptoms. And, and what is it? How many billions of dollars? hundred billion dollars they're getting every year from yeah. government and insurance companies. You know, so the, the freaking pharmaceutical companies are, are running the government. Just a split second before the schizophrenic began hearing uh, their voices, there was a register on the oscilloscope. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like this is the point at which they come in. You know, there's 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 a register, an electric electrical registration before the, the voice is even heard or understood. So it's like they're coming in from another place. It's like your brain is a radio set and, and these things are coming in at a very low frequency and the dial is set to that frequency. But if you increase this, the frequency to a more spiritual uplifting frequency, you're tuning them out. Yeah, because I, I lost fear of myself, you know. Another pattern is they foster self-destructive behavior. The voices are cons consistently advising the victims to behave in self-destructive ways that increase conflict, turmoil, and suffering. They sabotage any positive movement on the part of the patient. The intent of the voices is very different from the intent of their victims for themselves. And that's one of the ways you can tell them apart that, you know, with the prisoners, they, they, the psychotic prisoners, I've talked to them, that, was it your intent that you get thrown into prison? Was it your intent that you murdered somebody and you got thrown in here? And they said, no, no, I didn't intend to do that. Well, then whose intent was it? And they had to answer the voices because it was the voices that told them that. It's massively destructive. That's the worst thing they could do. You know? And that's one of the goals of the, the voices too. They foster isolation. They want the person to isolate, isolate themselves so they have complete control. So and that's one of their goals is to destroy marriages, positive relationships, relationships with friends. The ultimate aim of them is, is to shut out all others out of the victim, away from the victim so they have complete access to them without interference.